Yeah, hi, my name is Greg Dudek. I'm going to talk a little bit about robotics. And one of the many impacts I think robotics are going to have in everyday life, and I know right now they're busy switching around plugs on, on different computers, so I think we're waiting for that. We're good to go? <laughs> All right. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about robotics in the context of scientific exploration and how we can use robots in that kind of domain. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a problem that I think will link together these rather disparate topics what it's like to take a vacation picture, and what, how you take a good picture, and how a robot can take a good vacation picture, and the problem of detecting possible skin cancer on yourself, the problem of scientific discovery in general, space exploration, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so the question is, what do all these very disparate sounding things have to do with one another? And I think the connection between them is that they all involve looking for something novel or something new. And I'm in the context of taking vacation snapshots, obviously what you want to do is allocate your photos to your vacation, your holiday as it, as it passes, without taking too many at the beginning or the end, but somehow when novel and interesting things pop up. And likewise, if you're looking as a naive person for skin cancer, and I'm you know, checking myself out, I'm looking for strange and unusual things. And similar with all these other problems, and in particular the case of SETI, where we may have some notion of what extraterrestrial intelligence is like, but we don't really know until we find it. And the hallmark of that in the short term is going to be something weird and unexpected like when your clicker doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so I want, I want to talk a little bit about the process in most general terms first of scientific data collection. And scientific data collection has two problems these days. One is that the data we want to collect is often voluminous. There's a lot of stuff out there that has to be analyzed. And the other is the places we want to get the data are sometimes hard to access, hard to access for human beings. So for example, if we wanted to uh, do drug design, much drug design today is done using combinatorial chemistry. That means mixing lots of small amounts of chemicals together in many, many, many combinations. And that combination has to be done rapidly and it has to be assessed rapidly. In fact, Derek Ruth's talked a little bit, alluded to that in his earlier talk when he talked about doing it in simulation. But if we want to do this kind of thing sufficiently efficiently, we pretty much have to look at automation. And it's a kind of automation that is essentially a robotic system. If we want to look inside the human body, either to better understand how it operates or to tune it up and fix it and repair it, often that kind of work involves operating at a small scale, perhaps an extremely small scale, um, which may involve not necessarily inserting probes manually, but having devices that can move around autonomously within the human body. And there's a lot of work on things like that going on today. If we want to measure what's going on, in the Arctic the, or the Antarctic, or in this case on a glacier in Iceland, it's often very hard to acquire that data as a, as a human being. And so we'd like to think of automated devices that can go there and get the data for us. And if we want to think of collecting data on Mars, for example, well, this is, of course, a picture of Mars. And, and really, the only devices that are going to get us there in the foreseeable future are robotic devices. Now, naturally, we have some there already. But if we want to collect more data, we're going to need more devices. And right now, we're only really scratching the, the surface of what's possible. And this is a picture of uh, Axel Hybrid Island. It's part of the Canadian Arctic Research Network. It's a, a field facility run by McGill University. I think it's the farthest north uh, field facility run by any academic institution. Uh, and in places like that, we also need to think about using robotic systems if we want to collect data over extended periods of time, because it's very hard to get people way up there. So, so the problem is, if we want to get devices up there, they've got to collect data, and they've probably got co to collect data over extended periods of time. And when you're collecting a lot of data over a lot of time, then you've got to worry about who's going to look at that data. So if we think of the Mars explorers right now, the, the Mars robots, there are people who sit on Earth looking at all those photos taken day or night over the course of years. And that's barely at the realm of, I think, what's imaginable, if only because that's taxing, and so even if we have people who are willing to sit and look at those photos, it's not cl clear they're going to work at full efficiency over the kind of time scales that are necessary. So if we want to think about having explorers, whether they're human explorers or robot explorers, 
the job of those explorers isn't merely to go somewhere, it's to also select the good stuff there and find what's interesting. And so if we think of, say, our robot going underwater in the Caribbean, where, the, where it looks at coral reefs, if it only takes four photographs, it's pretty easy for me to look at these photos, say, hmm, of these four photos, I think the top right one of the fire coral is maybe the most interesting. But if we think of that robot being underwater for hours, or days, or maybe tens of days, or maybe months, this problem of data analysis and extracting the good bit, where was the highlight of this data set, becomes harder and harder. And so, so really finding the interesting data is in itself a very hard problem and an intrinsic part of the problem of doing exploration. And so we kind of zoom out of this set of photos collected by one of our vehicles over a very small fraction of its operating lifetime. We can see that it's getting harder and harder to say, well, gee, the really interesting photo is that number 172 up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, so let's think about the problem of producing what I'll call a navigation summary. And that's the kind of thing you do when you go on your holiday. Uh, we have a series of photographs taken by some vehicle, taken by a person, taken by a robot. And what we'd like to do over time is as that series of photographs is unrolled, we'd like to pick out the highlights, the ones that form a good summary of what it's seen and where it's been and how time has elapsed. And we probably want to do this in many cases in real time. So if you've got a robot on Mars, it's sending those photos back. You can't wait the full four years and then say, well, in retrospect, that photo on the second month was pretty good. Uh, so there are two problems that come from this. One is, how do we describe the images? What is it that makes things interesting? And that's a fantastic problem, but I won't talk about it, because it has so many sides. It has one side, which is a very generic side, related to very um, fundamental properties of information theory, and it has another side, which is related to particular domains. So this problem, for example, started in a, in a task where we wanted to inspect nuclear power plant cooling pipes in Ontario. And in that particular domain, there are very, very domain-specific cues you can use. I want to think about the problem of selecting the images, selecting the stuff as you're moving. That picture, that, there's a problem we had when we had that large, large array of tiny little photos. And so you can imagine a, a paradigm, a model, where we've got some summary of what we've seen so far, the photos we've collected so far. And as we go, move along, we take another photo, another observation, and we have to decide whether that current observation is surprising enough or not with respect to what we've already got. And if it's sufficiently surprising, we'll add it to our repertoire repertoire of good stuff. And so that comes up in many domains. It comes up in surveillance, detecting anomalous, weird, threatening activities in some environment. It comes up in planetary exploration, where we're trying to decide which rock should we sample. And it comes up in taking vacation hol uh, holiday photos. So, so I want to talk about an algorithmic solution, that is a computational solution that gives you a very simple instance of how this can be solved in practice. And this has two advantages. One, it gives you a flavor of how this problem can be solved. Two is, it'll show you one of the basic, classic, fundamental computer science algorithms. And as a computer science algorithm, what be, uh, t uh, professor, what better thing could I do on stage? And thirdly, it actually shows you the ideal way to hire one secretary um, in a very idealized, uh, condition. So let's assume that you've got 100 people to hire and they're going to file into your office one after the other and, you've, and each one you're going to evaluate with an interview and you've got to decide to hire somebody on the spot. And once they leave your office you can't go back and get them again. And the question is which of these people do we choose? So it turns out that in this simple idealized case, which is of course very much like the case of taking photographs with an old-fashioned film camera, you can... whoops. Um, you can, you can do many things, but pretty much every reasonable strategy you might imagine involves looking at the people as they come in one by one, waiting a while, getting a feeling for what the pool of applicants is like, and then at some point saying, okay, the person, I've, I've done enough waiting and evaluating, now I'm going to hire the next person who's good. And it turns out that you can prove in very formal ways that if you in interview about one-third of the candidates, one over 2.7 of the candidates, find the best one in that group, and then hire the next person who's better than that, that's the best possible thing you can do. It doesn't mean you always win, but in some probabilistic sense, you'll do better than anything else that's reasonable. So let's think about another strategy, a very re closely related strategy, the Lake Wobegon hiring strategy. And that's based, uh, it's inspired by the town that shows up in the, in the National Public Radio television show by Garrison Keillor called Prairie Home Companion. And that town is characterized by being the place where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. 
And so this hiring strategy involves going through your pool of applicants and hiring anybody who's better than the average of everybody you've ever seen before, who you've currently hired. In fact, it's very much like the strategy that Google uses right now. So they only hire people who are better than their current average. And this strategy guarantees that you're going to get better and better people in your company or in your organization, but it has a disadvantage, which is that as time passes, you hire fewer and fewer people, and an interval between those hirings becomes longer and longer. And so you th if you think of doing this on your holiday, it means that the place you visit that last week has got a very small chance of getting into your album. So these are two sort of basic strategies that allow you to think about how to select things as they become interesting. Now, the case of finding interesting stuff is even worse, because in that case, you've got to deal with stuff which is not just good or bad, but good or bad with respect to the changing notion of what you've already got and what's, uh, what's interesting in the future. Um, so let me look at a, let's look at an example of this thing running. I should really learn how to run this thing. Um, let's look at an example of this running in practice. So now we're going to see a, co a computer looking at, the f at a carpet on the floor, and as it moves around that carpet, it's looking at photographs of things, and it's going to select photographs that are more interesting than things it's seen previously. So on the upper left, you're seeing the computer's view of this little carpet, and on the bottom, you're seeing the, the, its souvenir photos. The, of the stuff it's seen. And so you're getting some rough notion that there are five things in this world, and it's actually ch selected a photo of each of the five things. And these complicated wiggles up the upper right are some, some notion of how interesting the current photo is and how we're doing over time. And so here's another illustration of that same, uh, that same kind of paradigm. So this is a, a set of photos taken by the Google Street View car, and so Google was generous enough to provide the raw footage to us. And here it's driving down the city of Philadelphia. This is speeded up at about 20 times real time. Uh, and in the bottom, we're seeing the souvenir photos of, of Philadelphia that the system has acquired. And I hope the feeling that you're getting, like me, is that this is actually not doing such a bad job of summarizing what the system has seen. Is it perfect? I'm not sure. That's actually a very hard problem, but it's doing very, very well. And here's an underwater case. So here's our robot, really the target environment for this work. And it's swimming on a coral reef in the island of Barbados. It's taking photographs of what it sees as it swims around there. And again, we're getting this evolving sort of vacation snapshot summary of the data that's been seen there. And the idea is that when the robot returns to base after its trip, it can show these photographs to a biologist quickly, one of the people we work with, and they can quickly perhaps assess where the highlights were in case they want to go there themselves or in case they want to look closer at the data without having to run through all of the hours of video that some robotic system might have acquired as it, as it explored. So, one of the questions one might like to ask is, how are we doing at this kind of job? How good are these solutions? They look pretty good intuitively, but one would like to get hard, qualitative, solid answers. And that's somewhat easy to do in theoretical terms. In theoretical terms, you set up a problem, and then you show that according to the problem you set up, you're doing okay. The real killer is to compare this to how people do. Uh, and novelty is an intrinsically tricky thing to define for people. And so one of the ways we're looking at that problem is we're doing surveys of human observers, and so people can go to this website and they can look at a set of photos and then they can choose their favorite summary, pick one of these sets. In fact, I invite anybody here to come out and give it a shot, and in fact, we can use your data to, to better corroborate our data. And it looks like we're doing pretty well in terms of not only doing good things in terms of information theory, but doing good things in terms of summarizing what people really like. And so one of the hidden stories there is, gee, people are actually then in whatever strange way they make their choices, they're doing in nearly optimal things themselves, perhaps. So let's talk about now putting this on robots, on robot explorers. So we have a, a fairly large family of robots, and a robot plane, and a robot boat, and some underwater robots that can swim and walk and things like that. And I'm going to talk about just one of the members of the family. This is the Aqua Robot version 2. This one's called Ramius. It's got six paddles that allow it to move around. It's got two computers inside. This is the the skull of the robot removed, of course, so we can see down inside it. And it's got cameras in the front and back and other kinds of sensors to tell if it's rolling around or moving. Uh, and here's an example of the very most, the most basic sort of elemental swimming behaviors. Pitching upwards, uh, rolling to one side, and, and yawing, turning. And of course, by compo composing these kinds of basic gates or behaviors, you can make more and more complicated types of uh, composite swimming or, or uh, 
uh, uh, hovering motions and things like that. And so the robot, by putting this together, has a wide range of different kinds of behaviors. So here you're seeing it walk on, on ice, as we all in Montreal know, uh, mu it must be learned by any robot or human. Uh, we're seeing it come out of the water. Uh, we're seeing it hovering in place uh, in the ocean. Um, and, and so that whole problem of how to put the gates together is in so itself a wonderful and, and uh, exciting problem. Here's a m slightly more complicated gate. It's one of the gates that's afforded by the fact that the robot has legs. Because it has legs, it can hover in place and kind of do this little ballet where it can stay in one spot and kind of look at something interesting. In fact, it could land on the bottom on its legs without causing a lot of disturbance, which, which is a big advantage in, in our particular environment, in the underwater environment. So, so one of the things we need to do is work with humans. Before robots can work alone, they need to work in tandem with an operator or maybe a collaborator or a biologist, ideally. And so here's an example of the robot swimming after a human supervisor, essentially. And it's using a model of the person's color, motion, and behavior, which it learns as it moves to swim after the person. And so it's kind of following along like a little underwater robot puppy made of aluminum. Um, <coughs> Now, we'd also like to tell the robot to do things underwater. And so in our early days, we thought, well, telling the robot what to do is easy. We'll do what scuba divers use. Scuba divers, when they're out of air, or say out of time, uh, make hand signals. Um, and, uh, and those hand signals are used to communicate to one another to say what's going on. So we thought, well, we'll make these hand signals of the robot. They're pretty hard to interpret reliably. So instead, we'll connect the robot with a glass fiber optic cable to a boat. Some poor soul on the boat will stare, stare at a TV camera all the time, and then they'll tell a robot what to do by interpreting the hand signals. So there's two problems there. One is, it turns out when you run a robot, you have to do a lot of things. We need to do experiment number four three more times before the battery runs out. It's a lot of hand signals. The other problem is the people on the boat, they're sitting on a boat watching TV hour after hour. Guess what happens? The person on the bottom is saying, stop the robot, and the person on the top is going, ugh, ugh, throwing over on the side of the boat. Um, that's really happened. Um, <clears throat> so, subsequently, we've looked at a different kind of paradigm where the human and the robot interact without the intervention of another person connected by a cable. And so here's an example of a person starting, stopping, operating the robot using essentially a specialized form of barcode that allows you to say a very wide range of things, very simple things quickly and very complicated things in complicated ways. Uh, and here's a slightly more sort of realistic deployment. This is in a lake uh, in northern Quebec where we're using this kind of cube to move around and program the robot to do various kinds of basic activities. And, uh, and here's one more example where this is in the McGill pool where the robot is again being tested to in a, given a slightly more complicated program. And in this case, the robot's actually responding and saying things like, are you sure you really want me to do that? So it's evaluating the program it's being given and then making some assessment about whether the program is reasonable and trying to convey that back to the, dry, the, the operator. Uh, so the robot also has the ability, as you saw briefly, to walk on... Uh, uh, on land, uh, it's a derivative of a large lineage of uh, walking robots going back to 1965. There was a robot called Rex, developed partly in McGill, Carnegie Mellon University, which then eventually led to this robot. And of course, it can swim underwater with legs, which is a very, very unusual thing. So it doesn't only work underwater. Uh, we also are looking at deploying it in Mars-like terrain. So the Canadian Space Agency in the south shore of Montreal has a simulated Mars environment the rocks, the distribution of rocks, the sand, everything is made to mimic Mars. And so we're looking at operating it in places like that, and that's a place where this notion of finding interesting things becomes super relevant and super important. And uh, let me just wrap up at that point. Uh, of course, the key heavy lifting in this is done by graduate students, uh, and, uh, and so I want to thank them for the work they've done. And I guess I want to mention the fact that I've talked a little bit about robots and scientific exploration. But it's clear that robotics is going to have an enormous impact everywhere in everybody's life very soon. Occasionally people say, well, where are the robots that I was promised? Well, if you've got a microwave oven that looks at your food, decides how long to cook it, and then does the cooking, I think that's pretty much a robot. And if we've got a Mercedes-Benz car that you can push a button on and it parallel parks, which of course we can all buy today, then that's also kind of a robot. And if we think about the Hubble Space uh, Telescope, which is basically this big piece of machinery up there that points itself and takes pictures and sends them back, that's also a robot. So they're already here. And I guess we should brace ourselves for the fact that they're not just going to be doing science. They're going to be doing a lot of other stuff. Thank you.